My name is Michael Wood. Since the age of 17, I've been willing to die in service to my community. In the U.S. Marine Corps, I was Sergeant Wood. Michael Wood spent 11 years in the Baltimore Police Department. Before Michael Wood is a very honest uh, individual. He was not liked by the Baltimore City Police because he didn't play the good old boy network game. As my career developed, I set out to understand why people offend instead of how they offend. The reason why these consent decrees don't do anything is because there's no enforcement or changing of the mechanism of incentives for the officers. So all you're doing is talking about it. You're certainly was going to cross. I was ready to shoot if I had to, but I was never going to cross that line. But you kind of wanted to shoot. Sure. What? Get what you inspect, not what you expect. Mm -hmm. So you are anywhere that's populated is your metric is based off of arrest. So you don't actually go out and engage with the community because that would be time that you could be getting the arrest that you're expected to get to prove that you're a decent officer. So you actually don't have any incentive to communicate. Michael, we should be looking for goals to not have people end up in the criminal justice system. Instead, every solution we have is to push them into the criminal justice system. It should not be up to Jeff Sessions to determine how Baltimore Police Department operates. It should be up to the residents of Baltimore. Jeff Sessions doesn't know anything about policing, never has and never will. I want to read a quote uh, that you gave the Washington Post, which struck me. You said, when you work in policing, you're inundated early on with the us versus them mentality. It's ingrained in you that this is a war. And if someone isn't wearing a uniform, they're the enemy. It just becomes part of who you are, of how you do your job. What I'm trying to say is, is that we are looking at people who are doing nothing new. And if we focus on the actions, then we can fix the things for next time. Because when you focus on people, we end up thinking we can chop the head off. They put a new person in and something will change. But if we don't focus on the methodologies look, look, and the institutions, then we will be put totally in a prison story. cell, do the paperwork, go back out and do it again. So what we really need is to change the incentives and disincentives so that no matter what the role, we're still going towards that objective There's that actually serves more occupation, you. more vehicles, if your answer continues to be violent, because we have to understand that everything about policing is inherently violent. I have come in there with authority and told you what you will do. Welcome to Changing Minds. My guest today is Dr. Michael Wood. Dr. Wood started his career as patrolman Michael Wood on the streets of Baltimore as an officer with the Baltimore City Police Department. He worked his way up to detective and later to the supervisory position of a sergeant. He has since earned his doctorate degree in organizational management and works as a consultant in restructuring police departments, improving police and community relations. Dr. Wood, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Daryl. I appreciate such a formal introduction. It is my pleasure, truly my pleasure, and I am truly looking forward to hearing your insights, as I'm sure all, all my listeners are. We know with all the talk about defund the police, get rid of the police, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, I definitely want to hear, hear your thoughts on all of it, because we are in a quandary out here in, in society. And um, I've heard you speak before. In fact, I've spoken to you before, back uh, shortly after you left the uh, Baltimore City Police Department. And you really impressed me back then with your ideas and uh, and your and your vision, you know, for the future of uh, of police work. So, but let's but let's go back and start uh, back to where your career began on the streets of Baltimore. What would, what got you into this to become a police officer? Was it a family thing? Your dad was a cop. Granddaddy was a cop. And um, how did you how did you evolve? What did you see? What made you decide you need to, to take a different course of action? with the police department? Yeah, I mean, historically, there is a lot of family involvement. There's usually some kind of influence in what leads you to be police. I, I did a paper recently that's talking about how gangs and police have the same kind of historical backgrounds where they, they, they have like this family lineage, this code, this insider's kind of network. But I did not come from that. And maybe that's why I ended up kind of being labeled a whistleblower because I just didn't have that history. My history really comes from being a silly child watching Knight Rider and watching cops on TV. I, I always looked up to it as, as something that could be good. I mean, I mean, I am a male and, you know, certain of us males with our masculinity levels 
like to do something that's full of adventure, adrenaline rushes, but I felt like this was a big compromise. It was kind of the best of both worlds. I could be this kind of rambunctious male and still be able to contribute to society, do something that helps people you're looked up to. And this is kind of a prevailing theme uh, when you get into it with police in general. One of, the, one of the things that policing does is it takes people from low class and it gives them the power and influence of upper to middle class, the way the laws apply to the upper and middle class. So you do kind of become like this separate person from the rest of society and you elevate out of your lower class, even though the salary is not high in big cities, you are talking about a climb from, from poverty into at least middle class. I came from section eight housing and wanted to, to break out of that. You have these aspirations to just you, you kind of like, I don't think it's much different than some athletes. It's just a more practical pathway. Like, how do you get out? How do you, how do you bust out of this thing? And policing is a way to bust out of the lower classes for sure. It always has been. That's why you have the Irish roots in a lot of policing because the Irish took on policing in mass to, as their way to catapult themselves from the lower classes in the past. So when I watched all these TV shows and I just wanted to go do it, by the time I was 17 years old, I was too, uh, I thought a little too rambunctious to be ready for college. So I went off into the Marine Corps to kill, really I was just killing four years until I could be a police somewhere and eventually decided to come back home to Baltimore um, where I grew up in the suburbs of. And I mean, that's where policing was to me. That's, that's where you went, that's where the danger was, that's where the excitement was. I wanted to go and help people, but I thought it was really great that I was also able to like fight people and chase guns and you know, go car chases and stuff like that. So to me, it was a really good deal. I never have any regrets. Um, I think the part of it being such a good deal for me may be a little problematic structurally. So um, I'm just not one of those people that came in with these high aspirations thinking I was going to change the world or anything. I wanted to change a little bit, but yet, uh, you know, still go out there and have the fun and thrill and adventure of being a cop. Yeah, you know, I think all, all boys at some point in their life growing up, you know, uh, being a police officer is one of the top five things. You know, we all want to be president of the United States. We want to be a policeman, want to be a fireman, want to be an astronaut, or we want to be whatever our father was. So policeman is definitely, you know, in that, in that top five. And uh, for, for, most, for most kids, and then as we get a little older, you know, depending upon what color you are, sometimes that changes. Because I remember, you know, when I was a kid, you know, all, you know, we'd call him officer friendly, right? Officer, you know, whoever he was, you know, he'd come to our school and talk about this, that, and the other, and let us wear his cap and maybe even take off his badge and pin it on one of us and that kind of thing. And, you know, we grew up uh, respecting uh, police officers. And then for some of us, uh, when we turned 16 and we got our driver's license, officer friendly was busting us. Uh, because of what we looked like, or we were driving in the wrong neighborhood. And while Officer Friendly treated us all equally in, uh, in elementary school when he came to visit, it was a whole different story now that we're teenagers out there driving. We look different, we don't fit the neighborhood or whatever. Did you see a lot of that coming up, you know, with your fellow officers? Now, I think this is a confusing thing that you don't often see. I think this is, this is generally something that comes from the perspective of the other side. You have to be subjected to state, the state authority of policing to see that. Um, I think from the cops role, especially, I mean, I come from Baltimore where the police department's 50% black and my police commissioner is black, my lieutenant's black, my mayor's black, my state's attorney's black, my president was black, my attorney general was black. Literally my entire chain of command was black and I was serving a black city. So I, ne it, I had to step outside and I didn't really step outside until I got into drug work, which, which comes a little bit later on. But one thing I, I wanna point out that you said is when you get a little older as, as a black male, 
you, you start, the police start to look at you differently. Now, there's two things there. I think that officer friendly was always a lie. Um, the objective truth is that policing is actually way less violent now than it ever has been. Um, so you, you're, you're actually in an improved police department that has a really bad image. It, their data doesn't actually reflect their image. Their image reflects the data of 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Eh, maybe you can even go to the early 90s. You know, we could say 30 years ago. So that, that is the kind of perception that people have, and even police themselves are bad at demonstrating that. But the reason why, um, and, and I never really understood this, I, I kind of saw it as very racist too. I saw a black neighborhood and I saw the, the police responding to it, and it was like, why are we always in these black neighborhoods doing these aggressive things, especially when you're, you're locking people up for minor offenses, like these traffic offenses that you're talking about. But really when I got into it and started studying more, there is an underlying reason. And that underlying reason is that society as a whole has decided that police respond to violence. We, we often, for some reason, have this, this narrative that police respond to demographics. Like, so if there's, you know, black males are disproportionately killed by police, that's actually not true. It's, but, but let's take that as a common exception. If, if black people, uh, black males are, are killed by police more often, that is a, is, you have to ask, why is that? You can't just say, because they're a black male. Now, because they're black is gonna be pretty problematic, but because they're a male makes entire sense. I mean, males, white, black, or anything, commit a lot more acts of aggression and violence and crime than females do. So considering that females are 51% of the population and, and males are 49% of the population, if we were complaining that males are disproportionately killed by the police or aggressively sought by the police, that doesn't make any sense. Of course males are looked at more often by the police than females are, especially when it comes to crimes of violence and just for the ability to absolutely carry it out to begin with. And that is a key problem when it comes to being a black male who is entirely innocent. The big problem is, is that other members in the black male community are committing 53% of the crimes of violence in America, despite being less than 8% of the population. And police respond to violence. They do not respond to demographics. So, they're, they're, so even when you start to factor in that kind of stuff, the numbers don't support police being uh, disproportionate in their applications against black males. They're actually extremely less likely to kill a black male than they are a white male. Where you get tripped up is they're extremely more likely to do all the other offenses, all the minor crimes, all the locking you up for something petty, all the excessive use of force, like throwing in an elbow or a punch or treating you a little too harshly in the prison system or getting a slightly higher prison sentence. Things like that are definitely where it's at, but for some reason we focus on the killings where it's actually not that way. It's in these other ways. And so the way these other things are happening is, is that when police respond to violence, they're looking for this very, very small percentage of black males that commit a huge percentage of the overall violence in America. And in the process of looking for those people, Cops arrest and are measured by what they do. Arrest, you have to bring in stats, you have to show like any other job that you're doing something. So who does the cop see? Well, while he's looking for the violent black male, there's a whole bunch of other innocent black people around him and cops will arrest where they look. If you would have assigned me to Wall Street to go after cocaine, I would have been up there busting heads and raiding houses and searching computers and digging into those rich people's lives. But the truth is, as long as they commit violence, no one's actually going to care. Mm -hmm. But uh, I understand that the, that the stats show that while, yes, there are more white males in this country that are, that are getting shot uh, by police than black males, uh, the stats that I, that I was aware of is that there are more unarmed uh, black males being shot than unarmed white males. The majority of uh, white males being killed that outnumber the blacks are the ones who are armed. Is that, is that not accurate? 
Well, see, I think that might have been accurate at a certain, you know, in a certain year. But if you take last year's, the most recent stats we have, 2019 stats, nine unarmed black males, 19 unarmed white males. But if you go by the proportion of violence, <laughs> blacks, black males, even though they're much smaller percentage, actually commit more acts of violence than white males do as a whole. There should be more black males being shot than white males because police respond to violence. Now, the issue of whether police responding to violence is right or not is a separate issue. The fact is, is that police go where violence occurs and then they lock up people where they are. So the people in those neighborhoods who are getting these more minor offenses are actually double victims. They're victims to the violence that's there, and then they're victims to the way policing and society as a whole responds to the violence. Those people are double victims. The Freddie Grays are double victims because of the Omars from The Wire, if anybody knows who that is. Cops are looking for the Omars, but Freddie Grays get caught up in that. And that's where we have our, all of our disproportionate issues are in the, the guy like a Freddie Gray who is completely nonviolent, may sell a couple of drugs, but you know, if I would have sold drugs growing up, nobody would have noticed because there wasn't violence surrounding us. Explain for, for our listeners who, are, who come from a wide uh, area across the country uh, who Freddie Gray was. I know who he, who he was, but uh, they may not. Right, so Freddie Gray was mostly the reason why people even began to know my name because I got very frustrated with our police department in the way they handled their arrest of Freddie Gray. So Freddie Gray was a, a young kid. I mean, the kid must have been 110 pounds soaking wet. And he would sell drugs in the hood um, right where I, I came up. This was his neighborhood where, and where he, he was arrested was literally the first place that I was as a police officer walking foot in these projects called Gilmore Homes. They're, they're like, I mean, they're the, the lowest place that you can end up to uh, in, in the country, basically. You're talking about the most violent neighborhood in the country in one of the poorest and uh, section, not even like section eight, it's, it's public housing. And he was selling drugs around there. Uh, the state's attorney, black state's attorney, black police commissioner, black lieutenant in the area, told the, the officers to go and, and make more drug arrests in that neighborhood. In the pursuit of those drug arrests, a lot of officers were placed in that neighborhood to look for anything because the theory is that drugs and violence are tied together. So Freddie Gray saw a police approaching him and he ran and police gave suit, pursued him, uh, arrested him and threw him down in an alley um, put him in a vehicle, and then he comes out of the vehicle dead in the van. Now, there's always a question as remaining of what happened in the vehicle or whether uh, he had his injuries earlier, but he ended up having his spinal column severed and ended up dying in police custody. Um, I think he died by the arresting officers dropping a knee on the back of his neck. I don't think it had anything to do with the van. But when he was killed, our police department, and this is in the midst of a, of a lot of media attention going on. And in this, in this myth, we, the, the Baltimore Police Department was just completely denying responsibility. And the bottom line is, as a professional, when we take a human being into custody, that human being is just like having a newborn infant handed to you. You are 100% responsible for that individual's life. And the idea that the police department was trying to set responsibility in these areas where, I mean, man, we, it might have not even been police fault. Like, look into this. There's responsibility where, you know, you could have been talking about equipment. You could have been talking about training measures and things like that. But they just refused to look and introspect on what was happening. And that's why I had to say, hey, if you guys are going to lie about what we do in something like this, then I'm just going to start telling everybody the things that we do that you deny and act like we don't do. And so that's, <laughs> so opening my mouth about those things is how people even paid attention really to that conversation and a lot of what's happening in Baltimore. So are, are you aware of the practice known as the rough ride? Yeah, of course. So a rough ride, I've definitely seen uh, uh, and been tangentially related. I have seen it firsthand myself. Two, two people who got rough rides. And a rough ride means you put the suspect in the back of a car where you don't handcuff them or something like that. And you drive around and you hit the brakes really hard. You accelerate really hard and it knocks them around inside this confined metal, metal cage. 
Now, with Freddie Gray, I don't, part of the reason why I don't think that happened is I don't think the evidence is there for it. And I really believe the, I know the officer who was driving the van and I know people that are related to him and that's just not who he is. But it is the people who arrested him. So, I mean, uh, and I, I think what police do a lot is when they, they grab somebody and they throw them on the ground and they drop a knee really hard on the back of their neck to pin them to the ground. That is a super common maneuver. So to me, what was most likely to have occurred that was what was most likely occurred. Chase him down, get mad, throw a knee in the back, a knee in the back of his neck, and he ends up severing his spine that way. And who, how would the wagon man know when these people don't tell? You know, the officers that arrested him didn't tell anything. What What is the purpose behind the rough ride? Yeah, I mean that's kind of like a humble arrest. There's a thing if you watch the wire. I, you know, always speaking about. The I, wire. I was on. I was on the wire. Oh yeah, I didn't know that, and I've watched the whole thing now. Yeah, I, I, I was. I was on. I was on two episodes. <laughs> Amazing. So now I've, I've been telling my daughter now she's old enough to watch it. So now we're <laughs> going to go through it again. But the wire, you know, for as far as East and West Baltimore are concerned, boy, the wire is incredibly accurate. And you see things in there where they talk about arrest on the humble. And that means when somebody's getting a little lippy with you, I mean, I even had a saying that most people talk themselves into jail. They don't actually go to jail for what they did. They go to jail for how they respond when the officer's asking about what happened. Uh, but so there's things like that where you just rough up a suspect or you treat them poorly because the, usually it has, has to do with a respect issue. Uh, I mean, maybe rough rides could happen to like a suspect like during an interrogation where they're trying to intimidate them. But uh, like, I, I think it's vastly more likely going to be sourced from uh, respect issues. Well, I, I, I can assure you, I, I, I had a rough ride and, uh, and it was definitely race related. Uh, and it was it was not out of any disrespect that I showed the officers. Sure. These were these were white officers who were absolutely racist, and we're talking uh, back in the 1980s. Yeah, and you know that's another good point though that you're bringing up there. A weird instance about policing is I, a lot of people say, well, why didn't why don't good where are the good cops if the bad cops are doing this? Now, you definitely see. A lot of those because that's what get publicized. But the vast majority of times that cops are getting in trouble is because other cops have told on them. And I grew up in a later era, but I started to realize at one point in time, this is this is gonna blow your mind. I I locked up a lot of people. I was an aggressive officer at nearly 400, it was like 397. And at one point in time, I was about six, seven years into it, I realized that I actually knew more cops who had been arrested, then I knew suspects who I arrested. And I really thought that that was a, a wild number and thing, and thing to, to consider. But what happens, and people around me had gotten arrested, and I didn't see them do anything, but it's like clicks. Those people didn't do those things around me. I gravitated more towards the detectives that were clean and the detectives that were dirty, they gravitated into their own little enclaves. So it, it I, I mean, it's, it can be obviously come off as an excuse, but for a lot of the, the like, especially very criminal acts, I didn't see any of that ever. So uh, there, there's that grouping um, where they kind of isolate. And that's why you don't want these very autonomous units because they need to interact with the other cops. It actually is a check and balance. Talk about, about the blue wall of silence, the blue code. So basically, the blue wall of silence is as most people would understand it. Once you put on that uniform, you're kind of like any other gang or any other really entrenched club where your ultimate loyalty must belong to that group. I think a lot of it is actually sourced from, from good means. They think they're the good guys. Um, I, I think when you think you're the goody, so to say, you can start doing a lot of very bad things if you go and subscribe by consequential ethics. So that's a lot of what happens is they think that in the end, it's much better to be silent, to keep up the club, maybe to protect the aura versus actually letting the guard down for people to see how vulnerable, um, how actually unprotected they are and things like that. So you have the, the group that's like criminal, no snitching, but that's very indistinguishable from the cop who thinks there's a, a consequential situation going on. Um, I, I always will say, 
people, whether they like it or not, have to remember that Hitler thought he was doing good. Um, and that is the way with most people at almost all times. They have either an unopened worldview or a, just a very narrow perspective. And what they think is, 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 even if it's a transgression, they justify transgressions because they think there will be a better result at the end. So um, I, would, I really have been working on trying to get police departments and others to accept flaws in police officers. Um, a lot of the reason police are locked up is because no one accepts their flaws or their apologies. So you can't apologize if there's no forgiveness on the other end. That's a very uh, common thread we will see in society at the moment. It's um, the way people react to the police is very cancer culture-ish and it's very misdirected. The officer on the street, even the one that roughed you up in a rough ride, he had a boss and a command system that allowed this to happen so regularly that they felt comfortable with violating their civil rights and committing crimes in the process. So if I focus on how bad individual cops can be with this situation, then I think it very much misses the point of what is enabling this system to happen. I very much view justice as what we do to prevent this thing from reoccurring, not to seek vengeance or revenge, which is what the criminal justice system is basically structured around. So you're saying that these, these cops, these good cops are trying to protect an aura uh, when somebody, when one of their fellow officers commits a transgression. Sure. Essentially, they are going against what they were trained to do in the academy. Yes. Right? And now they're out on the street doing whatever they want to do, and and their fellow uh, brothers and sisters in blue are protecting them. Does that does that not make the good cop or so-called good cop complicit in that action? Absolutely, it makes them complicit. <laughs> um, but I, I think if you draw out these lines, I mean, we are complicit. As I argue a lot, the the riots and protests make a lot of sense when there's no mechanism. So during the 60s, there was no mechanism for improvement, for changing things in their local police department. Currently, I have not been to a city yet, and I've been to all the states. Uh, I don't have, I have a clue how many cities I've been to. Every single one of these cities in America has a mechanism for actually achieving the thing you say you want to achieve as an activist when it comes to police reform. You have to convince your neighbors, you have to collect signatures, you might take you some time to do it, but the mechanism does exist. So uh, yeah, is that cop making a bad judgment call? Sure, but he's being supported by the public just as much as he's being supported by other cops. How, how is he being supported by the public? Oh, so the public is supporting him just by that, that very same way where what they're doing is, is they are allowing these systems to take place. If you think a cop should be fired or you think the police should be doing a different policy, that mechanism is 100% available to you to actually make that change. So the police actually don't even have the power to make that change. The public does. Well, I, I personally, just give you a little background, uh, in my lifetime, I have made 11 complaints against police officers, and only one was sustained. So what, what, what power does that give me? And, and the one that I, I made these complaints with internal affairs against these officers, and it just so happened that the one that was sustained, the person in charge of internal affairs at that particular time was a high school classmate of mine. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the way. <laughs> so it's not it's, it's things now, work, right? Um, I get what you're saying, and I I do agree that a lot of these things existed in the past, and that I don't want to be the person who's always being like, oh, don't be bringing up old stuff. And I know how that can affect. I know the echoes go through, but when it comes to what the police actually do. It's not, it's, it's, it's a constantly improving thing. Um, when we started 
looking at how many cops were killed by people, but, but how many people were killed by police officers. You know, we don't actually even track that data in America. The newspapers had to start tracking it down by collating stories and figuring it out. But when they did that, the first numbers that we got were about 1,300 killings by the police of, of American citizens, regardless of armed or unarmed, any of that. And now, just five years later, those numbers are already down to less than 1,000 per year. So we're only in a, or just, over, just below 1,000 last year. So while population is improving, these instances of violence are actually dropping dramatically when it comes from the police side. Now, is it good enough? I don't want to argue that it's good enough. It's certainly not good enough, and these things need to keep improving. But I can't help but, but see just from the other cops that I deal with and from a lot of other people in society, if you, if you overextend on your criticism of police, I think it backfires. Um, that's a lot to do with like the defund now. When you see defund policing going up, crime is going up. These things affect society in a certain way. These cities are having tons of problems. Their violence is off the charts compared to the, I mean, we have been on trends of incredible of, of violence dropping like mad in this country until just now in these last couple of years, everything is going back up. As, this, uh, as the movement turned away from reforming police, to getting rid of police and breaking down that societal order that they provide. I'm not arguing that it's the best system. I am not arguing that uh, it doesn't need to be improved dramatically. That is what I'm talking about. But to pretend like policing is not a net benefit on society at this stage contradicts all available data. Would it be fair to say that, uh, you know, we, we often hear, or we always hear rather, about two categories of, uh, of police officers, you know, the good cops and the bad cops. But would it be fair to say that there are three categories, perhaps? Um, we all know what, what bad cops do. Uh, a good cop will not do those things, but the good cop will not tell or snitch on the bad cop, as we say, protect uh, the aura. But the third category would be a minority category, minority in terms of numbers. And that would be labeled as the honest cop, the, the cop who will tell, sort of like the Frank Serpico, if you will. Yes, I get your point, but I'll say there's no such thing as a good cop. The, the Frank Serpicos and even the me's, and I'm not Frank Serpico, uh, we don't stay cops. So uh, the moment you speak, you're not a cop anymore. So once the honest cop reveals himself, uh, that person will not continue to be a police officer. Because he has thus endangered himself, right? Not only, I mean, I actually never felt any fear of danger from the cops themselves, but that's also because I've never snitched on any actual crimes. I think if I was involved in something and I started saying things to people that were actually committing crimes uh, and, and labeling that, maybe that would happen. I've never seen any, like, I've never had police treat me in a way that, that would be threatening at all. But I don't think we should view police as good. I, I really think that we should view us as a necessary evil. You need people like me to, and the thing is, I don't think I should be pulling over cars, but I think somebody, you need people like me when somebody is being violent, when something crazy is happening. These things occur. People have biological malfunctions and acts of violence take place. Gang violence is a real thing. I mean, these murders and these families greatly affect the black community more than they affect the white community, for sure. I'm sorry, I just really believe that if you really want to help a black community, you lift them up and you stop the violence and you don't burn down their neighborhoods. But the ultimate point being is, is that sometimes you need somebody like me to come in there and rough somebody up. You need somebody like me to go in there with a gun and put some, a, a threat down to society those things unfortunately do occur but i don't think we should be glorified i don't think that we should be the ones that we say look at this proud thing of our society it's more like yeah it stinks that we have to keep doing this we need to figure out ways to continue to reduce the need for this thing so uh, back in the past you mentioned you know back in you know years ago things have changed they used to fire warning shots in the air sometimes into the ground uh, before shooting at a person. 
And they also used to shoot somebody in the leg or in the shoulder, the arm. Um, today, their police officers are trained to shoot at center mass. Uh, so that person goes down permanently. Why no more warning shots? Um, so tactically, warning shots are an incredibly poor idea. Shooting is not nearly that easy. I think the idea that that existed in the past, like shooting somebody in the leg, I think that person missed and then they just said they tried to shoot him in the leg. I, I don't believe them. It, it, I am a highly trained marksman, an expert, uh, very elite in the Marine Corps, and I've been the best shooter in the history of the Baltimore Police Department. Verified, go check with their academy. But the bottom line is, is I would not take that shot. And I think that shot is extremely dangerous. The, not, the, one of the primary safety rules is to know your backdrop. And especially when you're in a city, your backdrop is people's houses and other people. Bullets don't just stop where they are. And people just don't stop when they're shot. Uh, a motivated person gets shot multiple times and keeps going after their adversary. The idea that shooting somebody in the leg is not a deadly shot is very wrong. Um, we, we have two arteries in each of our legs that if you hit those, you're pretty much guaranteed to die. So there are no like safe shots. And the reason, the, the primary reason that you shoot center mass is because there are no sh safe shots. So you aim for the biggest target and you shoot to stop the threat because Threats continue to come. Bullets are very small objects. It is not like TV. Bullets don't knock people over. Um, they're, they're just small pieces of metal being launched at somebody at a high rate of speed. It is not worth shooting up in the air. Bullets that go up do come down. Children have been killed in Baltimore on the 4th of July for people shooting bullets in the air. People have been killed in Baltimore by police who have shot warning shots into the air. Uh, Ed Gorwell is a case of that. If anyone wants to look up that case, he killed... A young kid, um, it was probably in the late 90s, and he killed him, a Baltimore police officer, firing a warning shot that was inaccurately shot. And that's just the way those things work. You, sit, you shoot center mass, and I can't imagine a professional shooter uh, arguing otherwise. Well, let, okay, let me play devil's advocate here. Okay, so, so you're telling me that, that the Baltimore City Police are just now discovering uh, Isaac Newton's law. <laughs> that what goes up must come down, right? Um, you know, but hold on, hold on. So, you know, uh, I, I, I would venture to say, and I, and I think that you, would, I'm, you know, that you would agree with me, that more innocent people have been killed by police officers for holding uh, their cell phone or their wallet or things like that or shot in the back than have been killed by bullets falling out of the sky from a warning shot. Agree. Okay, so why, you know, why, why not fire the warning shot if, if, it, if it may bring compliance to somebody? Yeah, you just simply don't shoot a weapon unless you intend to kill somebody. A handgun is not a warning device. It, it is a but weapon. It, it, it was back in the day. Sure, you need to find a different warning device, though. If you want to do a warning, it, it should not be a deadly weapon. Now, let's uh, move over to, say, the White House. Very, very few people, there have been many people who have attempted to breach the, uh, the fence of the White House. Very few of them have ever died. They've been shot in the leg, in the hand, the arm. Uh, these also are marksmen. And they don't shoot at center mass, even though they would have every right to do so. After all, the President of the United States is their primary client to protect. Right, right. But Daryl, if you're talking about a sniper on a roof with a rifle round where his backdrop is grass, yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm talking about, about people who, who come jumping over the jumping over the fence and the security right there on the side on the sidewalk. And even, even one guy even made it to the east wing of the White House, if you remember, last year. But the reason being why they do that is because uh, if if you if you kill the guy, you have no idea is is he working alone or is he part of a of some kind of um, conspiracy or whatnot. Sure, they may try to do that when they have determined that it is safe enough. But what I am telling you is, is if that bullet does not go where that person intends it to go, that is a criminal charge and that person is going to jail. That is a criminal offense to miss if that person wants to take that risk. And I, I don't think that that is just not intelligent. So so what, when did they determine this, that, that now police officers should shoot to kill rather than 
then shoot to maim or or shoot up in the air to to bring compliance. Yeah, why, I mean, why wasn't that thought are, about before? These things are at least 20, 30 years old. So I, I mean, these are such established principles that no one's going to revisit them. Um, it's li- like I said, it's literally a criminal offense to discharge a weapon and not control where that bullet goes. So if a sniper is doing that or somebody is doing that at the White House, um, this is an extreme exception to the rule and they shouldn't be doing it. And if that person gets close enough to actually being a threat, they will be killed for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that you're going to put a rifle around into somebody's leg isn't going to kill them. It's just it's just false. Well, we know that John Hinckley wasn't killed, right? Yeah, but there's I mean, that's the thing. So what you remember, the people who are killed by the police are an extreme minority. Millions of interactions of potential deadly force occur for each time someone's actually killed. So for each time you want to point to somebody being killed by the police, there are 999,000 examples where it went the other way. We can't use anecdotes. Anecdotes are very, I, I, know, I know they're, they're emotionally satisfying, but especially for somebody that's mean, like me dealing with policies, I'm not interested in anecdotes. I'm not interested in feelings. I am interested only in what will give us the better societal results. So, so every time that, you, you know, in the years that you were on the force, did there ever come a time when you pulled your weapon and did not fire? Oh, you all fired the time. time. Yeah, very, very commonly did I pull my weapon and, and not fire. The only time uh, I came close to firing twice in my entire career, and I was a very aggressive and active officer, most, most police, uh, it's something like 98% of cops never even withdraw their weapon from their, from their holster other than at the range. Mm-hmm. And how often do, do the uh, police officers train at the range? <laughs> I don't think anyone ever wants to know those answers, Daryl. So, so um, I trained for the range absolutely zero. I imagine most officers train absolutely zero. Uh, they go to the academy, they're taught once, and then we have to qualify once a year. The standard is so low that the training I got in the Marine Corps is far sufficient for me to be able to pass that test for the rest of my life without ever practicing. Um, so you became a, an expert sharpshooter or marksman in the Marine Corps, not in the, in the BCPD. Oh, God, no. No one has ever become a marksman in the police department. <laughs> <laughs> that, has, that has never occurred. These, these people are, you are lucky if the common cop could hit a target. Yeah, I, I, that's why I, think, I think the idea of that cops are even physically skilled the way you're kind of painting the picture is just not true. It's an extreme minority of people who can even respond intellectually and with critical thought when they're in a situation like that. These are very traumatic situations for the cop. To think that killing somebody, the trauma ends in the, in the, the, by the victim is just wrong. I mean, even murderers suffered uh, trauma from, from their events that, that occurred. So these, the idea that a cop can coolly place a shot or to even think logically or, or to think even in reality is just not true. I mean, when Betty Shelby killed Terrence McCrutcher and she thought he was reaching into a vehicle, she thought he was large like a demon. She's probably not lying. That's literally what she saw. The vision, vision is an illusion. Uh, we are affected by these influences and we have to be open about those influences. One reason why uh, you have this, this history of, of people in general being more aggressive against black males is we've sown into our society this idea that they were more dangerous and that has manifested it in study, study after study after study will show how that has manifested in people literally seeing black people as bigger and stronger than they are. Uh, that came out uh, also in uh, the Rodney King uh, incident sure. with the four cops. But, you know, I don't know that I buy that because that's not a reality. You know, black people are no, are no bigger or, or any stronger than anybody else. All right. So let me just throw this to you, Daryl. Human beings are programmed genetically to not be able to understand reality. That's literally what evolution is. If we had explored reality, so say you're a caveman back in the day and there's a bush ruffling in the field. If you go and figure out, is there a tiger behind that bush? You die because you found out reality. 
Now, if you just avoid that, that bush and never check out reality and imagine it is whatever you want it to imagine it is, eventually that's how you see the world, how you imagine it, it how you imagined it, and you avoid reality. The human being is completely incapable of observing reality. So I, I'm, not, I'm not following you. How does that apply to, to black males? Because it doesn't matter what they are in objective reality. A threat, a threat existing in objective reality is very irrelevant for the person who is responding. They are not seeing objective reality. No human being sees objective reality. So, so why is the black male a larger th threat than the white male? Well, objectively, they are a larger threat. So you have something like that that is true. Again, this is, this is a minority of the population committing the majority of violence in America. So there is an objective truth to that. A female walking down the street at 2 o'clock in the morning is not crazy to cross the street when a group of males are, are approaching her. Those, those numbers are very clear. Um, so she'd be crazy if she was crossing the street because there was, you know, two so, little boys. So essentially what you're telling me is that cops do uh, engage in racial profiling, and wh whether it's right or wrong. No, that's implicit bias. Oh, no, because, I mean, if, you, if you're saying that, that you know, 53% of, of whatever uh, black males commit these crimes and they are more violent and dangerous, then I go walking down the street at 2 o'clock in the morning because I'm a musician, I'm, all, I'm getting off yeah, a gig. Yeah. Okay, so now cops are looking at me as being potentially violent and dangerous. Where, where, yes. whereby they might not look at my white guitar player the same way. Right, true. So, so is, that, is that not profiling? It, 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 I mean, to a certain extent, yeah, but it's not Well, to the extent of my life being in danger, it is. <laughs> I, I, you're totally right. But what I'm trying to say is that truth is absolutely true from your perspective, 100%. But we have to open the door for understanding the perspective that is, that is getting that to occur. If police are supposed to be looking for people who are violent, again, I mean, I had to yell at my officers and I get how it sounds, but if you're going around in Baltimore and we're trying to stop violence and you're pulling over cars of 80-year-old white women, I am not interested in you being a police officer that works for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so <laughs> I mean, I was honest. Okay, you know? so, so so you pointed out, you know, my perspective is my understanding is my reality. Okay, I get that. So now help me to understand this. Eric Garner, up in Staten Island, New York, mm -hmm. the original "I Can't Breathe" guy, right? He's uh, he's selling loose cigarettes on the sidewalk. Uh, we don't actually have evidence of that, but that's the allegedness. Yes. Okay, that's the allegedness. Uh, and, and and let's stipulate that he was. Okay. Okay. So he, he's breaking the law. Should he be arrested? Sure. Should he be cited? Sure. Uh, should he be killed for it? No. All right. He, right. Should he be arrested for selling loose cigarettes? Uh, I don't even know if I'll go that far. But <laughs> if uh, selling tobacco uh, without a license is against the law, then sure. I, I, I don't have an issue with that. Yeah. I just know that there's no white kids getting arrested. in, a, in their Right. There are no white kids getting arrested for selling loose cigarettes. That's all okay. I'm saying. I don't know if that should be. A well, that, that's part of my point. But um, so he he's pounced on by several police officers, choked to death on camera and, and, and the cops are exonerated of it. No, no violent crime committed. He did not offer resist uh, resistance. All he says, was, I can't breathe. They passively then, okay, resisted, but now you give um, George Floyd. Who, who, who allegedly is passing a fake $20 bill. We don't know that that, that $20 bill was fake. We don't know whether, uh, if it was fake, we don't know that he knew it was fake. He may have gotten changed from somewhere, you know, but whatever. It's not a violent crime. And yet he is choked to death again, you know, on, on the sidewalk, on the street or whatever. Uh, both Eric Garner and uh, George Floyd are black, of course. And then we take a look at somebody like uh, Dylan Roof, of the young white supremacist who walks into a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, armed to the teeth with extra ammunition and mows down nine black um, people conducting Bible study. And when he is arrested, uh, instead of pouncing on him and, and body slamming him, and whatever else, we see the, the footage of them gently pushing his head down and putting him in the car and pulling the seatbelt across him. And he says he's hungry 
and the cops take him to Burger King and buy him a hamburger before taking him to jail to fingerprint and I'll photograph and process him. So help me understand that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we're, we will be uh, falsely attributing too much knowledge about those incidences to make these judgments. I am not cool with any of these anecdotal conversations because the numbers are very clear. These things happened to at least twice as many white people. Why are you not seeing that? There is a media manipulation into what you are seeing. These things happen more often to white people than they do to black people. All of these incidents, every single one of them happen more often to white people. So you would, should be able to see that. You're not seeing that, the vast majority of the public isn't, because they're being manipulated. Eric Gardner should have never been arrested, of course, but he did passively resist and the standards in New York are what they are. Those are the rules and the policies that the people of New York City could change if they cared enough to. So the, the, I get that he died and I get that the cops were let off. But if you train the cops to do something and they're being told to do something, uh, theoretically by the community, yeah, we can talk about how separate, how, how separate that tie is. But legally, you're not going to get a conviction on somebody when they followed what they were told to do. Now, you can't just say, oh, they died, so that's, they didn't do what they were told to do. That's just not true. George Floyd, when he died, for one, the coroner doesn't say that he was choked to death. And for two, the police officer's training manual has that exact position diagrammed on it. That's what those cops were trained to do. So do you arrest Derek Chauvin for that? No, you arrest the people who train the entire police department to do this. You're, it's, it's missing the forest for the trees in policing to ever think about the individual. I, I would have to disagree with that because, I mean, the man was lying down. The man was unable to breathe. Everybody on the sidewalk saw that. And Derek Chauvin st uh, kneeled on that man's neck long enough for him to die, intentionally to kill him. Yeah, that's just not true. I mean, you can't say that. Well, well, you can't say that, 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 that it is true. You can't say that it's not true. Right, but that's the thing. In our legal system, you must be able to prove that it's true. Well, I can prove that it's true by, by the fact that the man was handcuffed behind his back. He had, he had two other officers besides Chauvin sitting on him, one on his back, one on his legs. The other guy is standing on the sidewalk holding the passersby from getting too close. For eight minutes, the man wasn't moving. Why not just pick him up, throw him, throw him in the car? Yeah, and I can say that. But then you got to remember that he was in the car. I, I mean, Daryl, I don't want to call you out too badly, but I know you haven't no, watched call the me body out. cam call footage of that incident. Call me out. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, I know you haven't watched the body cam footage because it shows the entire thing happening. He's the one that asked to be put on the ground. He's the one that put the fentanyl in his mouth. Uh, we can't, we, we just can't be looking at that individual officer like they did this thing all on their own when they're following procedures. That's the procedure that the officer was taught. I know you disagree with the procedure. I disagree with the procedure, but that's irrelevant. That community decided and allowed for that to be the procedure that they've changed all that they've done with everybody. So to get rid of that officer and put another officer in, if the officer follows the rules, they're going to do the same damn thing over again. No, I don't believe he, uh, he was following the rules. It's not, it's Daryl, it's not from your opinion. This is in their training manual. It's objective truth. I, 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 I totally disagree. I, I'll, sh I'll send you the training manual that shows it. Okay, but, but uh, num number one, Derek Chauvin had 18 complaints against him in a 19 year career on the Minneapolis uh, city police. Daryl, we don't want to bring up the records of a criminal suspect when you, you brought him out and tarnish him that way. You can't look at the big picture when it comes to those things. You can't. Well, sure you can. I mean, it's, it's like this. You know, when you go to apply for a job, what do, you, what do you present? You present your resume. You present your past. And people determine... Um, hmm, but this uh, guy's not applying for the job. He already has the job. So, so if somebody has 18 complaints against them, all right, and, and they're still out there on the streets. Apparently, some of those complaints, have, at least 18 of them, have not been addressed. Perhaps if one of those 18 complaints had been addressed, right. perhaps, perhaps uh, George Floyd might still be alive. Sure, absolutely. That may be true. 
but who is it? Who is the community and the police department are condoning this? You can't say there's no such. I mean, we can't. No, have this the, the, community, the community is not condoning it because the community has no idea this officer has 18 complaints. We don't have access to his personnel file. The police do. We don't right, know that. I didn't know that until I saw it on the news, right? Neither did you. Yeah, but they are. Are you are you denying that they're voting for the mayor that's making the police decisions? They're not voting for their citizens to be murdered like this. Absolutely, they are. No, they're not. No. Yeah, they are. That? Yeah, I mean, we okay. So when this whole movement started, Daryl, wait, 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 which which movement? Black Lives Matter. Oh, I wasn't even talking about them, but anyway. Sure, sure. But the 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 the, the very public movement to uh, talk about policing and its its disparities against black males. So fr from that movement, at the very beginning of it, this started when we were talking about Barack Obama and Joe Biden and all the harm that they did to the black community. And I just watched everybody revote these people back into office. They are absolutely voting for these things. I, I don't know where, where you get this Joe Biden, Obama. We have been complaining about this long before you were even no, no, born. That's, that's Daryl, that's only my evidence to say that the, the very people who in one group were saying these people caused these things to happen, the communities are re-voting for those people all over again. Baltimore right now is increasing their, their, their work, their police surveillance. They're adding more officers. The same thing is happening all over the country. These things are, are the evidence is extremely clear that these things do the exact opposite of what people and the narrative is saying these communities want. It is a black grandmother that's calling 911 every time. So you're saying that racism does, does not exist on the police force? No, I'm telling you it's irrelevant. Um, I don't care is irrelevant? that a cop is racist. I care about racist you're, action. You're going, to tell, you're going to tell people who've been discriminated for 401 years it's irrelevant? Yes, I am going to say that whether a police officer is racist or not is irrelevant. Whether a cop does racist actions is what's relevant. Well, if a police officer is racist, the police officer is a human being, and there's probably about a 99.9% .9 chance he's going he's gonna to act on those racist instincts. No, nope, science does not support that whatsoever. The Science for Employees 100% supports that people who are employees of an organization respond to the incentives and disincentives within that organization. They do these things because they are incentivized to do so. I would totally disagree with that. Wrong. I, I know some <laughs> I mean, I, the, listen, the I know, more black listen, men you get put in jail, the better assignments you get. Let me tell you something. I know some racists on the Baltimore City Police Force. All right. I, I think I showed you the robe of a Ku Klux Klan leader, the Grand Dragon of, of, of Maryland. Now you want to tell me, I, I, he told me himself what he did on that force. And, and he did it behind the cover of the badge. So yes, sure. he was acting on so his So we instincts. can pull up anecdotes of criminal people. There okay, well, are always- why don't, you pull up, why, don't you, why don't you pull up some anecdotes of, of black people saying they're hungry and getting taken to Burger King? Yeah, it, it, it literally happens the vast majority of times. So you, you got to remember the inverse of that is that remember more, as we are arguing, more black males are sent to prison, more black males commit violence. These are just objective truths. And, all, and the vast majority of those people make it to prison completely unharmed. So, I mean, 99.99999%. .99 Do they get to go to Burger King? Absolutely. Have you ever taken anybody to Burger Absolutely. King? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's I, common I, practice. You want to build rapport. The first rule. You want to build rapport with somebody who just murdered nine people. Of course, you want to shoot somebody in the leg that's going after the president. It's the same philosophy. I think you're being. I just think you're being blinded to that. Your ideas being uh, shifted over to maybe benefit someone you're not agreeing with is a violation of your principles. I, I'm. I, these are the. We're the, we're aligned on our principles. It. it, it I just, I don't see you applying it to who you're viewing as your enemy. So racial profiling does not uh, exist in police departments. Is, is uh, I mean, of course it does. How we just talked about how, you know, a black male being in, in there is profiling. But you got to remember that a white person in a black neighborhood is also racially profiled. Right. Be because of the history. No, because, because of the police, history. No, no. Because no, no, no. Police, you know, you're, you're wrong there because you know what? 
uh, your observations and your opinions cannot possibly outweigh my experiences. I'm not giving you that. I'm giving you the overall big picture. I'm not giving you my personal experiences. Okay, because, you know, if you were to ask 10 of your male non-police friends, 10 of your white male non-police friends, just pose this question to them. You know, uh, you're coming home late at night. You know, you're working late shift or whatever, or hot date, whatever. You're coming home 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're by yourself, and you see those lights going in your rearview mirror. You're being pulled over one, for one reason or another. Maybe you were speeding, maybe you weren't. Maybe you were waging. Who knows? You're being pulled over. You ask 10 of those guys, white guys, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? I, 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 would, I would venture to say 9 to 10 out of 10 of those guys are going to say, I hope I don't get a ticket. I hope I don't get points on my license. I hope my insurance doesn't go up. And you ask 10 of your male black friends that same question. Their response, I will, I will almost guarantee you, 9 to 10 out of 10 of them are going to say, I hope I don't get shot. I hope I don't get beat up. I hope yeah, I make it. So what? So what? Well, yeah. what, why, why do they have that perception if it wasn't real? Uh, we've had, we've we had that perception. Of perceptions that Pardon that me? Real. The, the whole world thought that we were, that the sun was revolving around us for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Copernicus. Copernicus. Sure. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, is that these things, it doesn't mean it's true. I understand that perception is there. But again, just because you feel something does not make it reality. The objective truth is, is that I hate to tell it to you and I hate to tell it to everybody, but the data is clear. The white guy's more likely to be shot. I don't know what to say. I came in here with the same ideas that you're having. I hit the data and the data doesn't support it. Well, I don't know why the data isn't important unless it's been manipulated. Well, like no, Trump, I just like, explained to like, you that there's well, more. Well, I mean, just, just like Donald Trump is trying to manipulate the vote, you know, <laughs> the data doesn't support that he won either, does it? Well, all I know about is policing. What I can say is that right now, the, I, the data 20 years ago can be totally supporting everything you're saying. I'm not arguing that. I'm telling you that right now, 2019's data blows that idea completely okay. out of the water. I'd like to see some evidence of cops taking black murderers who just murdered multiple people or whatever, or even one person, to Burger King to get something to eat before they go to jail to process them. Can you send me some examples of that? I, I mean, sure, I'll, I'll look for them. But I okay. mean, just because you're not seeing, the media isn't presenting somebody this video. That's why I'm asking you. I, I, I'm not seeing it in the media, but you say it exists. So show me, that's all. Right, I mean, the one I go to all the time, I mean, I'll, I'll look for that. But I mean, it's not like, the thing, it's not like people are looking for that film. It's not like somebody's- I'm looking it. for it. I'm, because, because you're, you're disputing me. You're telling me that- it, it What I'm saying is, is somebody in Baltimore is not gonna be, is not gonna pull out their cell phone and record the police taking somebody to McDonald's. They're not gonna do well, that. Well, they didn't, they didn't record Dylan Roof going to McDonald's either. Right, somebody but, but, asked. But, the cops took him to, uh, to Burger King. We know that. Right, I, I hear you. But Dylan Roof being taken to Burger King is, I mean, I'm sorry. I, it just doesn't convince me of anything. It doesn't convince you of anything. No, I'm not interested in any, So a couple of detectives tried to build rapport with somebody by feeding them something. I mean, this is basic detective work, basic. You know, I might understand that when you take somebody in after they've just murdered nine people. You take the man, you bring him into an in interrogation room, and then you try to build your rapport. You want a cigarette, you want a glass of water, blah, blah, blah. I get no, that. That's silly. You do, vast, you do the vast majority of your rapport building in the vehicle on the way to there. That's, it's, just, it's just not how it occurs. I know you can have your opinions about policing. I don't want to discount your opinions, but you can't have an opinion about how policing actually transpires. Oh, I, I'm, I'm giving you facts here. I'm 62 years old, okay? I have a lot of friends black and white. And I've never had any of, of, uh, of my black friends or even acquaintances who've been involved in, uh, in, in police be, uh, be told that, uh, that they got a ride to uh, McDonald's or Burger King during their arrest. Well, let me tell you, this, policy-wise, this is what police should be doing. So for you Well, they should be doing what they are doing, two different things. I, okay, just let me move on to the main point is, is I don't want the narrative to be 
how we punish other suspects more. It should be in how we treat everyone else the same. Well, you know, if people were being treated the same, uh, Dr. Wood, we wouldn't be having this conversation or, or a lot of the problems that we have in this country right now with racial divide. Agree, but we can't, we can't attribute malice to what can be attributed to in policy or malfeasance. Look, there are just as many bad officers as there are black citizens. Do, do black citizens commit crimes? Are black citizens violent? Sure. Are there white citizens who are violent and commit crimes? Sure. Are there police officers who go overboard? Absolutely. No question about it. All right. But it seems to me, you know, racial, racial profiling does exist. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm giving you the answer of why it exists. And as long as this thing yeah, is but, true, but as long as as long as, as it exists, somebody like me, who is a law abiding citizen, is, comes under suspicion. And that is not fair. Right. But if you but Daryl, if, if somebody killed your daughter and the cops were out there looking for an Asian female, you would say, what the fuck are you guys doing? Well, if somebody killed, uh, if I was looking for an Asian female, what do you mean? Exactly. Because an Asian female isn't going to be the one who killed your daughter. If your daughter went missing, if you had uh -huh. a daughter, a 16 year old daughter, and you lived in Baltimore and she went just missing, or she ended up dead with a bullet in her head, and you started looking for Asian females, you would be a moron. Well, if I had reason to believe in Asian females, I understand. Her, but if you're just searching with a net, if you don't know anything, if I don't know anything, I, then everybody is suspect. If I don't no, know that's anything, that's not true. If you were in Baltimore, literally like 90 or Chicago, 90 percent of the murder suspects and victims are black. And what about the other 10 percent? They're so, white. And if you're in a white neighborhood looking for a looking for who killed a white person, you're going to be looking for another white person. This is well established and well known. You know, all this, these things are interfamiliar. This is bull. OK, I was on the no, radio. All crime is interfamiliar. I, I was I was on the radio at one time with a guy that I respected. And I totally lost complete respect for him. Uh, he, he was a, a talk show host and we were talking about racism in uh, in, in, in policing in Washington, D.C. He was telling me that his father was a police officer, not him, but his father. Southeast D.C. is predominantly black, as I'm sure you probably know. And um, back in the day, in the uh, in the 90s, when I was on the radio with this guy, uh, it was it was a very high crime ridden area. Uh, and it was predominantly inhabited by by black people. There were a few white people who lived there, but mostly black people. I lived in a, in a uh, in an area of Maryland called Potomac. Maryland, which was uh, affluent and all that kind of stuff. We were the second black family to move into my neighborhood. Uh, I moved in there at, at the age of 13. And my father, who drove a Mercedes, was constantly being pulled over in our neighborhood. They thought he drove, he, he walked in and drove out with somebody's car. All right. And of course, when I turned 16, I got the talk, you know, what to do when you get pulled over, et cetera, et cetera. Sure enough, when I turned 16, I was getting pulled over in my own neighborhood because uh, the white cops thought I walked in and drove out with somebody's vehicle. You think I didn't get pulled over in my own neighborhood? I don't know whether you did or not. Of course okay? I did. But, but, but I can tell you one thing. My white friends that I went to high school with didn't get pulled over unless Maybe they were doing something stupid. Maybe they were better drivers stupid. than you. Pardon me? Maybe they were better drivers. You have to eliminate Well, again, so you know, again, you, you, you are offering your opinions. OK, and your opinions do not outweigh my experiences. you you got to understand that. I'm not saying they do. But if your question is, is why these things are occurring? Well, well no, I, I know why they are occurring, because I'm black in a white neighborhood. I don't fit the profile of the neighborhood. That is racial profiling. OK, of now, course. now, now let's go back to South. But, but hold up, Daryl. Yeah. Daryl, please look for what is out of place. So I'm out of place in my own neighborhood. No, you're out of place in a white neighborhood. Yup. Why am I out of place there if I can afford because to live there? Because you don't look like everybody else. These are the so I, I have to look. Daryl, this is what, this is Darryl, supposed to be. Daryl, hold on, hold on, please, Daryl. I'm not justifying it. I am explaining it. But you're explaining it from basically what you're telling me is cops are too stupid to look. <laughs> yeah, I've been what you're making saying. this argument from the very beginning that cops are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we're not Listen. disagreeing on this. I'm trying to explain to you why these things occur. 
and you can't not finish the sentence. It isn't because you are a black male, it's because you are part of a group that commits the vast majority of crime incredibly disproportionately. Okay, so, so Ted Bundy's son should always be suspect because his father was a serial killer. Is that what you're saying? No, will people sure do you that? Probably. I, again, again, Daryl, I am not justifying. I am explaining, and you will not get the world to change their opinion. Okay, so as long, hold on, as man. long as the condition exists that black males, eight percent of the population, commit fifty-three percent of the violence. This will always be the case, and it's not white people doing this. You've got to understand this. Black people feel the exact same way about what black people so so you're so you're saying that uh you're saying black on black crime exists uh that's indisputable it's like 92 percent of black victimhood is from a black suspect it's not black on black crime it's, it's crime of proximity of, of course okay. that's why i said interfamiliar that's why so it's okay. actually more it's but wh why don't we hear the term white on white crime uh, I, I mean, you do, just nobody cares what happens to white people in this country. I've never heard the term white on white crime until I just said it. But, I mean, I hear it all the time when, I, when in the circles that I'm in. I hear it all the time. But what I'm telling you is, is you're not going to hear this because people in the media don't care what happens to white people. Uh, they, they, they care that they don't shoot them. They care that they take them no, to they Burger don't. King. No, they don't. I just explained this to you. The data is clear. Okay. White people are killed disproportionately more than black people are. But the stats, since you're in the stats, look it up. The stats also show that more unarmed black men have been Negative. killed by police. 19 unarmed white men were killed by police last year. You're talking Nine about in Baltimore or the country in Carol. general? Where, where, where are you talking about? Baltimore or the country I'm in general? I'm talking about America. Last year in America, all of America, Nine black males were killed that were unarmed. Nineteen white males were killed that were unarmed. White people commit the minority of violence, yet they compromise over 100% more times getting killed unarmed. I ain't making this shit up. Well, I think, I think your data is wrong, but let me get back, let me get back to My Southeast. My data is not Hang wrong. On. Let me get back to Southeast D.C. Okay, so I'm talking to this, to this uh, talk show host, and I was telling him what I just told you about driving around in Potomac in my own neighborhood and getting pulled over. And he told me that uh, his father was a cop, and, and had he been a cop, he said, if I was driving around, he's a white guy, if I was driving around southeast and I saw a white guy coming into the, in, in, into the neighborhood, I'd pull him over. And I said, why would you do that? He said, well, I figured he'd probably be over here, over there trying to buy drugs. Yep. So now... So you agree with them? Yeah, that's what happens. I'm telling you, that's what happens. So, so, all, so if I saw hold, on, hold, on, person, hold on, hold on, hold on, Carol, just hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, I, let, I let, let me finish. Cop. Let I mean, me finish. Let me finish. I just listened to you go on your tirade. Now let <laughs> me go on mine. All right. So, so you agree with this, with this, with this moron? Because you're telling me essentially that a white guy going into a predominantly black area, okay, he may be out of place. He must be over there trying to buy drugs. So essentially what you're telling me is that, that all black neighborhoods, all they do over there is sell drugs. Maybe he's going over there to see his black girlfriend. Does that, maybe. does that dawn on you? Maybe, maybe you know, there's a white, there, there are some white people who live there. He may be going over there to see her. He may be an insurance salesman who's going over there to sell some black person, some policy. But you're assuming he's there to buy drugs because you think all black people in all black neighborhoods sell drugs. That, that's what I'm hearing from you. I, I don't know how you just turned racial bias. No, I, no, I, I, into listen, racial you, bias you know, no, you, you, you keep talking about perspectives. That's your perspective. You know, if, if, if I, if I go in, into an what all white, perspective, hold, Darryl, hold on, I'm hold telling on, you what hold on, cops hold on. do. Okay. Hold on. If I, okay. You, you look at me, you see a black man. Okay. I drive into an all don't white. Don't tell man. me what I do. Okay. I'm not telling you what you do. I'm, okay. I'm asking you, what do you do? Okay. I'm a black guy. I drive into an all white neighborhood. What is your assumption? You don't know me. I, I you don't see me. Looking at you, I have no assumptions. Okay, so what are the cops' assumptions? They see me. I mean, if you're a 16 to 24 year old black male and you're in my neighborhood, yeah, I'm going to look at you twice. And, and and what are you thinking? I mean, you're a grown you're a grown man. You, you, the odds of you committing a crime of violence are extremely low. Okay, so I'm a 16 to 23 year old black man. What sure. what are you thinking? What, what why am I in that white neighborhood? What are you thinking? 
Am I, 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 mean, I, am I, am I, am I there to rape white women? Am I there to rob no, their I mean, homes? Don't, please don't do that to me. You're, no, you're, I'm just asking because, you know, when, when I said to but, you. But you're not be, be, hold, hold on, hold on. All I said was what this, what this uh, talk show uh, said, that he would suspect that this white guy into a black neighborhood is there to buy drugs. Before I even asked you anything, you said, yep. You just jumped right in and said, yep. Okay, I, I, so, yes, how, so, so, no, so, so you're, like, you're going to pass, hold on. You're going to pass judgment on a black neighborhood but you won't pass judgment on a white neighborhood. Why is that? I don't understand the judgment. So police look for things that are out of place. Okay, okay. we understand that. So um, a white kid that is driving a car that clearly looks like they're from the county, um, who is in a neighborhood, that should reasonably scare them. Um, yet they are there. I'm going to think if you're in West Baltimore, that you're up to no good. Now, if are you in, are you a white kid driving in Prince George's County? No, I don't. I, I don't care about that. That's why I say you being in my neighborhood. I don't care about that. But if you are in, in, in the hood of East or West Baltimore, sitting on the corner all day long, are you doing something illegal? No. But people are going to think, hey, maybe this dude's a street lieutenant. Of course they are. That's what police do. Just because your attention has been drawn doesn't mean you're being violated. Police attention in all training needs to go towards that which is out of place. That's literally how you protect a neighborhood. How can I protect a neighborhood other than looking for what doesn't belong in that neighborhood? Okay, great. So a black guy sitting on his stoop, young, young black guy sitting on his stoop for several hours or whatever, he, he may be looked at as a, as a street lieutenant. What, what does a white guy look like sitting on his stoop for several hours? Where is he? Uh, and, and I guess in is he in West Baltimore? Is he in Hampton? Is he in Pinkham? Okay, well, okay for, first of all, I don't, I don't live in Baltimore. The only time I ever go to Baltimore is when sure. I have to play there. So we, we say West Baltimore, Pinkham, none of those mean anything to me. Sure. So, so we have in Baltimore, we have area called Hampton and an area called uh, Pigtown, which are majority white, uh, high crime areas, and they are treated exactly like like the black neighborhoods are. Okay. So so then a white a white guy. So now, I, I, um, um, West Baltimore is, is predominantly black, though, right? right? Right. Okay. So a white a white guy sitting on a stoop in Pigtown for several hours, he would he might be looked at as as a street lieutenant. Yeah. Are you telling me? Yeah. So he's looked at the same way as a black guy is. Yep. Okay. All right. I'm I'm just making sure that that uh, that there's equity here, there's equality in, in how and how and how you're profiling these yeah, people. I'm not saying that. No, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying police. I'm not claiming that any of these things are, are what is good for society. I'm not claiming that any things, these things are the right moves. What I'm telling you is, is that human beings operate based upon their DNA and their experiences. And when people's experiences are constantly flooded with black male violence, they are going to react. Just true. There's nothing I can do about that. Okay, so let me say this. When I, when I walk into a, a bar and let's say there's a country band playing there and it's, you know, the whole band is white, uh, most of the patrons are white, and I walk in and people turn their head and look at me, I should automatically assume my life is in danger, but your white guy's looking at me. They're why? Gonna, well, why not? Your, your, your situation matters again. So like when I said Prince George's, if you're in a wealthy black neighborhood and you're just a normal uh, middle class white kid driving through a white black uh, wealthy black neighborhood. Yeah, nobody thinks anything of it. This, this depends upon your environment. You've got to be around violence. What, what it's who is saying? around violence. It's what I'm trying to tell you. It's, I'm not deviating. There will be no principal changes. Police are around violence. If your neighbors are violent, you will be treated disproportionately. Yep. So you judge a book by 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 uh, by looking at the no. Paper. This is not me judging you're, a book. This you're is guilty me by association. To you, what happens? So as long as communities and police leaders, political leaders, neighborhoods continue to have police that respond with violence to violence, that's the basic principle of American policing then this will always be the case that innocent people will get caught up 
when they are around violence. If you avoid violent areas, nothing will happen to you. Oh, yeah, and also, if you avoid white police officers, nothing will happen to you. Black police officers are empirically more violent than white police officers. Oh, here so we I go again. Understand. So black, black, black citizens and black police officers are, are right, a lot more because, violent. Because the conditions don't change. Crime is interfamiliar. A black so, so cop. Why, 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 I'm explaining, why aren't, Daryl. Let no, me hold explain. Hold on, hold on. Why aren't white people Dude, uh, violent? you got to let me explain. Why aren't white people violent? They are. They are? Yes, they are violent against other white people. But not against we, black people. Again, all crime is interfamiliar. So to think that because someone becomes a cop, they suddenly betray what is universally true around the entire world for other groups of human beings is just simply false. Black cops are more aggressive with black suspects and white cops are more aggressive with white suspects. And how about white citizens who, 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 uh, who commit violence? They're not aggressive with black people? I don't understand. Well, you were saying that black cops are more aggressive with uh, black people, yep. and that black and that uh, and that black people commit uh, the majority of, of violent crime. Is, is, is this is this majority of violent crime perpetrated against predominantly black people or against white people or what? Against black people, all crime is predominantly interfamiliar. So black on black crime is about ninety two percent. White on white crime is about eighty five percent. There's not a whole lot of difference there, but uh, no. No, it's it probably it's just a statistical anomalies. Now, what about uh, uh, cross familiarity? It, it, it's, it, it almost never happens that a black person kills a white person or a white person kills a black person. It's extremely rare. You never heard of the Ku Klux Klan, I guess. Again, I am not. I am not concerned with information from the past. I respect the, the past. Echoes. They're still around. No, they're still around. They're not. A, they're not an influence. Okay, so. I get your point, but I mean, don't take away what you. you but they're not. They're not. A, they're not an influence. And we look at we look at uh, things like Charlottesville just three years ago. We look at things out out in Portland, Oregon, with the white supremacist marches. Right, that, Daryl. That I mean, violence. you're literally telling me about one incident that occurred. No, I can tell you all kinds of incidents about uh, about that that has occurred I mean, with. Uh, it's been four years. Can we stop hearing about Charlottesville? No, it's been three years. August twelfth. 2017. Granted, and I hear you, and you know, you can say what about ism, but look at Portland, look at Minneapolis, look at Philadelphia, look at Baltimore. These cities are burning to the ground, and it ain't from white people. Okay, so I guess it was a black guy, 17-year-old, that crossed over from Illinois in, into Kenosha, Wisconsin, and shot three people, murdering two. And that was self-defense, and you're talking again self about white and white crime. Self-defense? What are you talking about self-defense? That was clearly self-defense. He will never be convicted. Oh, I, 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 I'll just beat you on that. That's but, fine. But uh, how do you figure that was self-defense? Why was he even there with his gun? Who cares why he was there? He had why, right why was he even in Wisconsin? I mean, do you want to break down the situation? We yeah. can, but he had every right to be there. He was on private property with the permission of the owner. I don't know what to tell you. He was on private property with, with the permission of the owner. So he came from Illinois with his gun. No, he did not come from Illinois with his gun. You heard that from the media. He has not been charged with that. No police make that claim. That gun, he did not bring across state lines. It was already across state lines. So where did he get it? Uh, I, I, he works down there or had friends or something like that. I don't remember the exact story. But again, you can pull these anecdotes, and, but these anecdotes have a spin to them. We are not looking at the truth. These, these situations haven't even been settled. And to, to pull out these, I mean, it's literally like, look, one white guy killed one white guy, and somehow that's evidence for what? What do you mean it's evidence for what? But it's for what? That's the, you're calling Kyle Rittenhouse KKK? No, I'm not calling him KKK at all. I'm then what are you I'm, calling him? I'm calling him a lone wolf, a violent white guy who committed uh, two murders and shot. Why can't, he, why can't he just be a violent guy? Why does he got to be a violent white because guy? Because you're the one talking about violent black guys. No, I'm ex you are. I'm explaining to you why this is the case because of the data. Well, the data shows this white guy came across state lines. No, it and doesn't. And killed, and, yes, it does, and killed two people. Now, now He killed you know, one he, person. He killed two okay. and blew off the third guy's arm. Okay, well, the point Kyle is. Kyle Rittenhouse. Th that's fine, but he hasn't even had his day in court, and look what you're bringing up. Uh, well, yeah, okay. 
because we, right, we, know, right. we, so, we know we know we know until proven guilty daryl daryl davis said okay so quite nice so 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 derek chauvin didn't kill george floyd i mean did he commit a homicide it yes. appears so but again again the medical professional says that that did not occur the ME says that he overdosed from fentanyl. It does not say that he was asphyxiated. I can't change that, Daryl. And so you believe every ME, right? I'm not saying I believe that. Stop strawmanning the hell out of me, Daryl. What you, what, I don't know, and you're pretending to know that which you do not know, and it's indistinguishable. I know what I saw on camera. I know that that man did. I know that that man did not have to have his. I know that that man did not have to have his knee on that man's neck. It doesn't matter minutes. that he didn't have to. He did, and it was a, it was by police training protocol. And how many pounds of pressure did he was he applying to that man's neck? All right, let me ask you a question. No, or, answer the question. How many pounds of pressure was he applying to that man's neck? Uh, enough to kill him. You come on. That's how the many answer. pounds of enough pressure to, was he putting on his neck? Enough to kill him. You have no idea. No one in, with a medical expertise who has examined the body claims asphyxiation. No one. Literally, Daryl Davis is claiming with no medical degree, no experience in this subject whatsoever, that he knows the truth. That is just a real stretch. Well, you can say that if you want to say that, but we all witnessed a murder. Uh, no, on, you didn't. I, yep, yep, you witnessed yeah, a I homicide. I, I, I witnessed a lynching. That's a I lynching? Mean. A lynching, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, and let me explain that to you. I witnessed a lynching by a police officer, okay? And police officers have been known to lynch people, especially black people. And, and, and what is the definition of a lynching? It's when somebody is, is, is taken and, uh, and they become judge, jury, and executioner before they have their day in court. That's the definition of a lynching. And it, now we, I'll, I'll go back to the past and then I'll bring it forward to, uh, to Derek Chauvin, all right? There, there have been many, many cases before you were born and even while you were, while you're alive today where officers have left the jail open and people have gone in there, snatched the uh, black suspect and strung them up in a tree. It's called a lynch mob, okay? They leave the gates, the, uh, the cell, the, cell uh, the police station door open so they can go in there and do that. There is evidence of that, all right? In 1982, uh, a black man was lynched by the KKK in, in uh, Mobile, Alabama, named Michael Donald. Uh, 50 Derek, years, 40 years ago, Daryl. What? 40 years ago. So what? Yeah, well, guess what? Just a few months ago, it happened again. I'm not again into indicting people Chauvin. from 40 years ago. Four months ago. Four months ago, uh, George Floyd was lynched, okay? That man should have, should have had his day in court. Sure. Okay, well, he didn't because a police officer lynched him. That's why he didn't have his day. I mean, lynching is, is like, so, I mean, it's such a hyperbolic, like, I, I'm really surprised you hear that language coming from you. Well, don't be surprised. I'll say it again if you want to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm being serious. I, I am too. That, that's, a, that's a real stretch. No, it's not. No, you know, they had every Are opportunity. Are you saying that about the black cops that kill black suspects? Sometimes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, without a doubt. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not playing favorites here. I'm just talking about what I see. Now, what, what would you say about, about the four cops uh, who beat Rodney King and the 10 that stood around and watched? Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any questions there. Um, a question as, as to what? Were, were they wrong or they were, or they were, Every were they right? Every single one of them was wrong. All 14? Yeah. Why? Uh, they were all violated basic pro protocols, even of police protocols. Even of, all, of all things, like, I'm about professional policing. Okay, so, and so, so if they, things were, so if they, they were wrong... If they were wrong, uh, then, then how come uh, they, they, they got off? Yeah, whether or not they get off in court isn't evidence for whether they're... they're but I'm asking you, why, why did they get off? What allowed them to get off if they were so wrong? I, I, have, no, I, I have no idea. I don't you, know... You, would you like me to tell you? I mean, you're going to say racism. Yes, I am. Sure. But that was back then. I, I agree. I'm not but arguing. That, you know, that's always your go-to. Oh, that was back then. That was back then. That was back then. Son, it still goes on today. I'm not saying it doesn't go on, but at the numbers that and the portrayal, the threat to society idea is it's just the, the stats aren't there. We're going to have an, we're, we're going we're gonna to revisit this conversation, you and I, 20 years from now, 
and I'm going to bring up Charlottesville, you would say, oh, that was back then in 2017. We're talking about now in but, 2042. But what, what is your evidence of Charlottesville? I mean, it has nothing to do with cops. It has to do with one person driving a car into into a lady. I mean, that that's that's the one incident. I mean, literally, oh, the there, riots there were, there were a lot more, more innocent than, black children than there were anything a lot more than that one you can come up with for the last 15 years. There were a lot more than just one incident in Charlottesville. Now, what I'm telling you is, is without a doubt, the incidences that you can find of any kind of racial killing of white people on black people, which Charlottesville isn't one, again, that was white on white crime, again, all crime is interfamiliar. So the- All crime is interfamiliar? All almost crime. all, 92% black on black is interfamiliar. 80 freaking whatever it is, 5% of white on white, it's interfamiliar. Mm -hmm. So what was Dylan Roof? That's really how many yeah. white people killed black children last year? Zero. You know how many black men killed black children last year? Hundreds. How many white men killed white children last year? You know probably that? hundreds. You think probably? Well, how, how is it that you know how many uh, black ones did it, but you, but you probably know how many white ones did it? I don't, I don't deal in those numbers. I deal in, in dispelling the narratives that are going out in public. So, so you only deal in black numbers? N no, I, I, I deal in urban policing. I don't understand what happens out in the middle of Podunk, North Dakota. I don't know that. Well, how, about, how about Baltimore? How about the white, the white neighborhoods in Baltimore? Are there any murders over there? Zero. There are zero white people killing uh, black children in Baltimore. Zero. But black men killing black children has occurred at least 10 times in the last two years. In Baltimore. In Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So, you, I mean, like, these are the stats that I see. This is the reality that I see. When I'm responding to a call for violence in Baltimore, it's the black family that's being devastated. So to think that the cop is racist when he wants to go after the person that devastated a black community, it just doesn't make any sense. It does make sense when he goes after me and I have nothing to do with it. Right, which in which case I would say that it's wrong. But what I'm explaining to you is, is that police being in those neighborhoods, no one's coming up with an alternative idea. You're literally overwhelming what these communities want. If I go take a vote in West Baltimore about what they want, they're going to say aggressive cops getting these thugs off the corners. That's what they're going to say. Okay, so what, so, so what is your solution? Not so my solution is a community invested thing where community is directly in charge of the policing. It's called civilian led policing. So it's basically a blend of police management with a uh, policing organizational. So if you think of what a company does, like say Exxon, they're, they're switched by profits for their shareholders. I take the exact same kind of principles, apply that to, to policing and where the community is the shareholders, the invested people who have been in a community for a very long time, 20 years is my minimum, those people are in charge of the policing and determining what the policing will be doing and how they will serve it. Because we can't rely on individual ethics. My judgment of morality and your judgment of morality are just irrelevant. A community, it needs to come together, establish communal ethics and how they want their police to behave and enforce those standards. The mechanism is there. So if you don't go by that mechanism, this is what the people want. We can sit here and argue about better ways to do policing and the problems in policing. But the bottom line is, is neither one of us have made the case that policing is worth changing to these violence ravaged areas. We've not made the case that policing is worth changing? Really? No, we have not. I have completely failed at that mission, without a doubt. So, so, then, so then what, what are all these marches about then? If, if, if people don't think that uh, police should change. Uh, I think they're about uh, power and tribalism and they have no purpose or intent. Really? Absolutely. So, so you're telling me that millions of people who've been marching uh, across our country uh, in these major cities have no purpose and they're just, and no intent. They're just about yeah, yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you, since we love anecdotal experiences, but okay. I've been all over this country. Example, Buffalo went up there and in Buffalo, they need 7,000 signatures and they can put any reform measure they want on the ballot, any reform measure. Every activist that we spoke to across this country said all these things were way too difficult. Every community we talked to said it's all way too difficult. 
to get 7,000 signatures. The next day, they go to a protest with 20,000 people of it, not a single person with a clipboard doing signatures. If we look at Portland right now, Portland actually did it. They just got a law passed that is going to be devastating to Portland. But the ignorance of these protesters got a law passed that shifts all the power to a bunch of the elites because they tried to get something done. You can do it no matter where you are. And if you're not changing it, it's because you don't care. It's super easy. So what, what would your solution be? Change it to what? And what would the ethics be? So it's definitely communal ethics. Um, legally, one of our biggest problems, so this was my research dissertation for my PhD, when I, I found this research that was explaining how in England, and England does policing much better than we do, in England, they measured people going into the police academy and then when they came out. And they found out that they had a higher sense of moral conduct and moral behavior before going into the academy than when they left. And what's really crazy is they lost the level, measurable levels of morality at the same time they were receiving training that we know is highly effective at increasing moral conduct. So even though they were receiving training that we know increases morality, there was something that was completely breaking that process and actually resulting in less morality. So I got with a whole bunch of, I, I don't know who they are because it, it was facilitated, but I used my connections to connect with a whole bunch of academy commanders and to do a thematic analysis of what was happening at their academies. And then I don't just go for what they say, I read between the lines in a thematic analysis. And then what I discovered is that there's this huge problem between communal ethics and individual ethics. Ethics and morality are being discussed as if they're both the same thing and they're being used interchangeably. So now an example of this is legally, what happens is, is if an officer feels, now we've talked about feelings a few times in this conversation and how people's perceptions are, but if an officer feels that they're under threat and they portray a reasonable level of that, that, that threat, then they can kill somebody. They can use force to whatever extreme they want. Now that's them feeling a certain way. That's their individual ethics. They had to make a moral decision. That's what the law says. And, but what happens is a community, when you're doing policy, this is communal ethics. So the community would, would be saying, the officer needs to do what we think they should do, especially since they are a servant and an employee. I would completely agree with that concept that the employee needs to do what the employee is told, not what the employee feels. But we are very caught up in America and as a whole in how people feel. So right now we have interchangeably woven throughout the law and throughout policy that something should be ethical, but we're not defining where ethics comes from. And I think the community very much avoids this conversation. I think the legal system is avoiding this conversation. And one reason why the community, through all my experiences with these riots and going to, I've been to almost every state, been to all these cities where all these things have gone down, they don't actually want to do something because if you do something with great power comes great responsibility. And in that case, when you tell the officer to abide by communal ethics and they follow what you told them to and it goes bad, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. And I think we're all much happier trying to act like the problem is Derek Chauvin when the problem is a much bigger picture than some individual. So, so, so Derek Chauvin is, is simply doing what he was told to do. Well, we can't determine intent. We are all blind to intent. The, I, unless somebody writes a letter and they're like, I'm going to go kill my wife with this hammer I bought from the store today, then we can never even begin to, to project. Yeah, but you, but you told me just, just 45 seconds ago that, uh, that the officer, if he's in fear or whatever, he can use whatever extreme force that he wants to use. I would disagree with that. It should not be whatever extreme force that he wants to use, but whatever extreme force is, uh, is, is uh, within the confines of the law. I agree with you. But what I'm telling you is the law says... His feelings determine what he's allowed to do. His feelings, that's what the law says. So Derek Trillian's feelings that he wants to, uh, to kill George Floyd is okay? No, his feeling that the person was a threat. And so the guy was a threat because he was... No, we don't need him. to determine whether he was an actual threat or not. We don't? That's going to be... No, that, I'm telling, this is what I'm trying to explain to you. 
the law establishing Garner, uh, can't even remember what it is, no, Graham versus Connor establishes that an officer has, is reasonable fear of his life or the life of somebody else can use deadly force. And that means it's just the officer's feelings. Okay, so, so what fear was Derek Chauvin feeling and those other uh, two officers sitting on him? I mean, that he was being re resistant. He was being combative with them. There's, there's, there's like 20 minutes of video that show it. What, what, uh, what, what resistance was he offering at the time they were sitting on his legs and sitting on his back and sitting on his neck for eight minutes and 46 uh, seconds? What, uh, what, what, what resistance was he using then? So, so when somebody is being aggressive and then you have them pinned down and they're no longer being aggressive, it doesn't right. mean Ali Ali oxen free. But no, but you have control over that individual. So why, so why continue uh, killing him? Okay, sort of like, uh, do, do you agree with what happened with Walter no, Scott? Listen, listen Daryl, you, you are claiming that Derek Chauvin killed this man. I understand where you're coming from, but this is pure emotion. There is no evidence that that took place other than the video you watched, but you don't know, that is not, it's just, it's just not evidence. You don't know how much pressure was being put on and his bones were not broken. There's nobody, there's nobody that's examined that body that's calling this asphyxiation. You're, you're injecting that. No, the man said he couldn't breathe. So you're saying he's lying. That's irrelevant. Do people say they can't breathe all the time? That very same person, if you go and you watch the videos, Daryl, I know you didn't watch the body cam. I know it because he spent 20 minutes saying he couldn't breathe while he was just sitting on the curb. So why, so why do you feel that he's lying? Maybe because he, he was clearly lying when he could breathe. He was saying it for 20 minutes. How do you know he could breathe? Because he was sitting in the back of the car. Go look at the video. This is why I know you don't know. Because the man said he couldn't breathe, you're, you're going to call it a lie. Do you, do you know what was going on? He, they put it, they, he said he couldn't breathe right. while he was just sitting there. I'm not saying that he can't breathe, but if you're going to have a 20-minute conversation, Daryl, you can breathe. So then he asked to be put on the ground. You can see video where he has drugs in his mouth. He put fentanyl in his mouth and overdosed on fentanyl. I'm sorry. So, so then why, well, and so why didn't the cop get up off of him? Why did he wait until he was dead before he got up off of him? When the, when the man was not moving. I, mean, I don't know, Daryl. But what I'm telling you is, is you don't know and I don't know. But the Minneapolis Police Department training procedures literally tell the officers to do that action. I'm what, sorry. What is and your I take? know that bothers you. What but is your that take on the, uh, you, what, what is your take on the Walter Scott case? I, that's clear cut murder. Huh? Clear-cut murder. Why is it murder? I, I, he shot somebody that was running away. But the guy was being aggressive with him. It doesn't matter. He wasn't being aggressive with him at that moment. And neither was George Floyd being aggressive at that moment that he died. And by your opinion, those officers... No, by, no, by anybody's clear. opinion. Yours too. You did not see him getting up off the ground and fighting with those officers. No, just because he was unsuccessful... At his acts does not, I mean, you're literally saying that, you know, like the guy being pinned down didn't punch anybody. If they let him go and he punches somebody, I mean, come on. Okay, so well then, well then by the same token, you know, the guy, uh, Walter Scott was being aggressive with this cop. He was trying to hit him, grab his gun. Yeah, if else, the cop would have shot him while that was going on, it would have been justified, absolutely. But right, he exactly. He, he had his back to him. He was running away. Right, he so what posed, are you arguing? Hold on, I'm arguing because... He posed no threat. To and the he cop. was convicted of murder, Daryl. Exactly. Exactly. Because he shot somebody in the back who posed no threat. Right. George, George Floyd, uh, in, in his last eight minutes on this earth, posed no threat. You, you have no evidence of that. You have no evidence that he did. <laughs> There's video. You didn't watch it, Daryl. No, no, no. Listen, listen. The video is irrelevant. We're talking about in the here and now. You keep talking about, oh, that happened a long time ago in the past, in the past. The video you're talking about is, is in the past. In it's the two last, minutes in the past. It doesn't matter. In the eight well, minutes. Everything's in, in the, the past. Eight, in on, the eight man. minutes, in the eight minutes, in, in, in his last right. eight minutes Look, on I'm this earth. I'm not justifying Derek Chauvin what he did. What I'm telling you is, is he followed departmental procedure. End of conversation. He followed proper police procedure. Yep. In the conversation. 
According to Minneapolis Police Department, he followed the training that they gave him. You cannot try and call, charge a cop with murder because they followed the procedures that the community established. So he's just too damn stupid to know the, the, what he was doing was yes. wrong. And, and the two guys sitting on his back yes. and, and were also too stupid yes. to, to see. Uh -huh. yep. so, so, maybe, so maybe they should be charged and, and, and locked up for the rest of their, uh, their life for stupidity. Right, and see, now this is you not wanting to change the, 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 the criminal justice system. This is you wanting to make the criminal justice system be your tool for vengeance and revenge, and that shit needs to fucking stop. No, that's not, that's not my, my tool. It okay? is. No, because if they wanted it, is it also a police procedure not to investigate 18 complaints? Every complaint has to be investigated. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, and, and, and they just let him off. And so, so he's back on the Daryl, I don't know anything about those cases. So to bring something up to me that, again, that you know nothing about and that I know nothing about is disingenuous. Well, you know, you know about complaints on the Baltimore City Police. What I'm telling you is, is that the policy is to investigate every complaint. If they did not investigate the complaint, then they are wrong. But I don't have evidence. Neither do you. Okay. So if somebody... If somebody is uh, is drunk, drunk if, if somebody has one DUI or DWI, that's bad enough. Do you think a person should still be driving if they have four DWIs? I don't think any of these things are up to me. I, I, I'm just asking your opinion, that's all. Should someone be able to drive after they had a DUI? No, if they've had four D, DWIs. I don't think they should be able to drive after one. So the, so the license should be revoked? Sure. Okay, so, so do so, I think the cops should be fired? Absolutely. But but no but no punishment beyond that. It's not a criminal offense. To kill somebody is not a criminal offense. Not for a cop. So then they just have a, a 007 license. Hey, don't yell at me. Yeah, it's a double sword. Don't yell at me about the no, law. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say double sword. I did not say double sword. I said 007 license, a license to kill. Yeah, I, I mean, objectively, the law says that all you have to do is be in fear of your life, your feelings. Yeah, that's the law. So, okay, so, so if I get pulled over late at night and this guy, this cop is being aggressive with me and I fear for my life, do I have the right to shoot him and kill him? No, you're not a cop. Oh, so I have to be a cop to do that? Yep. So, so, so cops are just above the law, in other yep. words. So cops are, you saying cops are above the law? Objectively. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie to you about anything. I, no, I appreciate that. I mean, this is part of the appeal. So when I started this conversation with you, I talked about how the police, when you become a cop, the rules of the elite start to be applied to you. Now, is Bill Clinton going to be charged with a murder? Absolutely not. Neither is a cop, you know, un under, unless you got it hands down. It's just the way it works. Okay, well, Michael Wood... <laughs> I'm not telling you it's right. I mean, that's the thing. I feel like a lot of the conversations with me are people thinking that I'm justifying something. I'm not justifying anything. I will tell you the ways we need to fix these things. But if you want to know why cops can kill people and get away with it, it's because of Graham versus Connor. It's case law. That's the rules. You need to change the rules. If you want to change, you can't change the Supreme Court ruling, of course, but you can change local departmental policy so that anybody like that's immediately fired at least. But you're also telling me that, that cops are psychophants to the training. You know, they don't have any, any, any independent sense of, of, the, of their own sense you of ethics. You can't. You can't. This is what I'm trying to tell you, Daryl. See, this is why this is so complicated. That's individual ethics. If you begin to have officers that operate upon their own individual morality, the door is completely open. The door is open for what? Anything. Uh-huh. So is that why you remember in, um, I guess it was Minneapolis, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you remember the situation where the older uh, white guy approached the police and they shoved him down onto the ground and, and he bashed his head on the sidewalk? Yeah. And, uh, and then about 50 of them walked by, one of them bent over, and the other cops like scooted him along. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that, is that what you're talking about? That one cop had, had his own ethics, hey, I need to help this guy. And the others, like, no, 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 you don't help them. Well, um, I, I think that is a, see, these are these things. I get really frustrated whenever I, like, I mean, this has been my whole life. When I watch movies that talk about the Marine Corps, you know, it's like, so in Minneapolis, and why I get frustrated with these things a lot is, is 
I don't mean to insult you because I, I know this comes through media, it comes to a lot of sources, but people end up speaking about things that they don't know and don't have any experience with. So while the, the cop pushing the guy down was wrong, we then extenuate that to what happened afterwards. Now it's basic riot control procedures that the front line stays together and you're not supposed to stop for any reason. There are people behind the line that are supposed to deal with that kind of stuff. So the reason that the other cop was dragging it, we told him no, is because that's not his job. He's literally screwing the system up. Even though this man is blind, they're bleeding, he could be dying. Right, it's like a pilot f flying off out of formation. It's not that individual, that individual officer's job to do that. There, there's a safe area behind the line. That's the whole point of the technique. So you push the line forward, you create a safe area, and then the medics will take care of him. And there's officers behind those people that will take care of him, which is what happened. Okay, and you realize the officers lied about it, right? I mean, that's not true. It that's is a true. median trope. What are you saying? Uh, I mean, I've seen the statements from the officers. I mean, they, they, they didn't say anything crazy. Uh, well, now, you, now you're gonna tell me this comes from the media. Mm -hmm. My understanding is, okay, uh, they, we, we saw on camera, they shoved, two, two officers shoved the guy, he <clears throat> went down, all right? Then yeah. about 57 of them yeah, walked Yeah, but hold by. on, he'd also been warned at least five times. Doesn't matter, that's, that's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. It, it is. It's okay, not. But, well, difference of opinion here. I mean, you can't, you, can't, you can't disregard a lawful order and then act like there aren't repercussions for that. Uh, I, think, I think you can. Okay, I mean, that's that ridiculous. Guy, that, that, guy, that guy was not violating anything. Yeah, he you did. Know, he violated they, the order to clear the area. He did. They, they were not rushing. Any, they weren't running. They were walking. Yeah, that's what they... I'm just telling you okay, but that he violated the law. You can object to the law, but you cannot object to the reality that he did. Let me finish, okay? They shoved him down on the ground and went on by him without uh, rendering any kind of assistance. They're not supposed to render assistance, but okay. No, all right, let me finish, okay? And then they lied about it until the video came out and that's what got them in trouble. They said he tripped and stumbled and hit his head. That's what the cops said. Now you gonna tell me the media made that up? No, but I mean, you're saying that this is, again, I understand what you're saying. But you got to understand that. I'm asking, why do they lie? Why do they lie? Why don't they say, hey, we shoved them? I'm because... trying to explain, Daryl. Good. If you apply these principles to every other scenario, you will begin to see them fall apart. What I'm trying to tell you is, is you don't know that that's not how that person saw it. They could have seen that he tripped. That could have been their perception. He could have been like, I barely touched the guy. I have no idea why he fell. He must have tripped. It doesn't make any sense. I've done the same thing myself before. I have seen a kid, I've been chasing a kid, and I'm telling you, the kid, he's running down the street, and I'm getting ready to tackle him, and he's got a bubble jacket on, he looks like he weighs 200 pounds, and I go to tackle him, and I realize the kid weighs about a buck ten, and I just blasted him with a tackle I shouldn't have, because I misperceived the situation. That's not criminal. What is criminal is this. We saw the video. We saw the cops clearly shove the man, and he stumbled backwards and fell and hit his head. Okay, sure. and then we heard that the cops said that he tripped. Okay, he tripped. Right. No, he didn't trip. He was shoved. Okay, and then that's when the video showed that and verified that the cops were lying. You, you don't know that they were lying. You know that they were wrong. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Somebody injects all kinds of drugs, all right, and the heart speeds up and goes into arrhythmia or whatever, and the person dies. Mm -hmm. All right. The, uh, the, the death certificate says the person died of a heart attack when actually the person died of a drug overdose. You, you understand the difference? Well, I mean, the, uh, a good ME should be saying that they drug, died of a drug overdose. Right. Okay. So take a look at Elvis Presley. He died of heart arrhythmia. We all know the man had all kinds of drugs in his body. I'm not that interested in that. Body. That was obviously covered up for politics. And, and, I, and, and don't you think police cover up things for politics too? Yes. Okay, so that's my point exactly. The man did not trip. He was shoved and the cops lied for, for whatever reason. Again, you don't know that they lied. You don't know that they did or, or that they didn't. I don't have to prove that. You're making a claim, I'm not. Well, yeah, all, all you're doing is protecting the police. 
No, I'm not. I'm trying. I'm trying to inject. You're trying to be objective, but but you you saw on camera they shoved the man. They shoved him. He didn't just walk up to them and and, and try right. To and if feet. you want to start saying that every time somebody who's wrong, I didn't say every time. I said on camera. A lot of people are going to be in prison. I'm giving you one particular example. I'm not yeah, I don't care time. about anecdotes. You got to understand that. Yeah, well, obviously you do because you're defending it. You're defending that that these guys it's didn't explaining lie. Explaining the situation that. once again. It's the explanation is not justification. What do you mean? I, I'm not I, just because I'm explaining a situation doesn't mean I'm justifying it. You keep saying I'm defending something just because you don't okay. like my explanation. No. Well, because how, how can you defend when you when you again, I'm something? not defending something. I am providing explanation. So you're providing explanation that two cops shove an old man and, and you're telling me you don't know that they lied about being tripped that and there was no, they're, they're shoving the person is part of training. Your problem is with the training, not with the people. This is why I keep trying to, if you are focused on the individual, you are focused on individual ethics, and you're missing the point, and you're focused on revenge, which is missing the My point. My question is, to you is though, okay, so why can't they just say, we did what we we're trained to do. We shoved the guy out of the way. We gave him five warnings, he did not, hold on, he did not comply with us. We do what we're trying to do. We shoved him out of the way and kept on going. That would have cleared everything up. But instead, they shoved him out of the way, and then they lied and said he tripped. That's, that's the what difference. You, that's what you're claiming. No, I bet that's, what, that's what I'm proving. I proved that. You're, you're not right now. So I let's am. go back. I already did. Daryl, let's go back and pull the reports, and I'll pull the reports. I'll get the reports from the police department, and we'll see what they actually claim, not what the media filtered to you. So how do you know what the media filtered to me is a lie? I mean, I heard that stuff too. And then I go back and I pull up the documents. I mean, I don't expect you to be able to go and do that every time. But this is what I do all day long. Okay. So what do the documents say? From what I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to pull up off a of memory. What I'm trying to tell you is let's go get the documents okay. and let's go see what they say. But it's basic police protocol to cite these things. The, the okay. idea that they're not going to say it would, would blow my mind. And, and, and would you uh, would you say that 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, every time a police officer fills out a document, he tells the truth? Almost never. He never tells the truth? Almost never. So, so why are you defending that then? I'm not. I'm explaining it. Stop saying I'm defending it. Okay, so I'm telling you the cops lie, and you're telling me they lie. No, you need to prove that they lie. But I don't care me, what you tell me. Okay, but, but you're telling me that, that they almost never tell the truth. What's right, those are separate incidences. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that when police fill out reports, they will say that we have been trained to do it this way, and this is what we did. That's literally the justification, and they use that to the extreme. So you're injecting that they didn't do that when this is something that cops do too much. No, what I'm saying is, if, if they're trying to shove the guy out of the way, he did not comply with an order, so they shoved him out of the way. Fine. Okay, but right. So let's pull up their report to see what they actually said. Within, within, within. Why isn't the media held accountable for saying that the cops said that he tripped and fell? The, the media is never held accountable because they're subject to. They're allowed to have their own opinions. And so, uh, so then again, I ask you, well, do the cops ever lie? And you said all the time. So, I, I said nearly. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. so so then, how do you know that they didn't lie this time? Th that's not the argument we were having. It is the argument I'm having. I'm, I'm saying no. they said he tripped. And you're Darryl, saying that's not Darryl, the case. So the burden of proof is on the person making the claim. Look, we're not in court right now, so we can't talk about burden of proof. No, this, this is not burden of I'm not talking about court case. I'm talking about rational conversations. The rational conversation says the, Darryl, they said they should Let me finish sentences, please. Huh? Let me finish some sentences, Go please. Go ahead. And then you let me finish them. Yes, sir. The burden of proof is on the person making the claim, regardless. You done? <laughs> yes. That, that sounds like an incomplete sentence to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, I don't know. You can't get around that. If you are making a claim, you need to provide evidence. You're saying they lied. I'm saying you need a lot of evidence to say somebody lied. You're saying that they didn't say that they followed training procedures. I'm saying I would find that incredibly unlikely. I didn't and say that they didn't say out. they followed training procedures. You're telling me what the training procedure is. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I can go along with that. If, if a cop tells you to get out of his way, hey, I'm clearing the sidewalk, it's time to go home, 
you know, or, or, or take, you know, finish your drink, I'm a, you know, it's closing time, whatever, and you disobey with that order, then you suffer the consequences. I get that. But that is not what was reported. What we saw, we saw- You didn't read the report, Daryl. This is what on. I'm trying to tell you. Did you read the report? No, that's why I'm not making claims. But yeah, but but yet you're defending somebody. I am not defending. Board. Once again, I am explaining so, to so you. So every time, every time the media says something, then it's a lie. That's what you're telling I've me. had the media lie about me. The I've had the media lie about, about me too. Daryl. I've had the media lie about me as well. I want I just said that. You gotta let me finish and now I'll get there. I promise. The media has lied about you. The media lies pretty much about everything. You need to look for yourself. And so do cops. Agree. Okay, you so keep why? Hitting me as your enemy. I'm not. So, I'm just somebody that knows the subject. Right. Really. So why? So why can't you accept the idea that perhaps the media was telling the truth? That the cops said the man. Tripped? Because I don't believe the media because they said so. I don't believe you because you said so. I will need to see the report. And if you see the report, and the report says the man tripped, we don't know how he tripped. And he, he tripped and and hit his head. Then then what? Then 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 what do you say? Oh, it's just another antidote. You, you can't say that they're, they're lying. What do you mean I can't say they're lying? Because they can perceive a trip. You don't know what it was like from their perspective. Listen, if I put my hand on you and push forward and you fall backwards, yes, you're going to trip. But you trip because I pushed you. No, you obviously don't understand domestic violence or have never been around it. You, well, you're right about that. I haven't. So yeah. tell me about it. I, I, I mean, people I, fake I, this shit all the time. How does it work? People fake shit all the time. I mean, have you ever seen LeBron James throw a flop? Have you ever seen what? Have you ever seen a professional player of, in basketball flop? What do you mean flop? You mean Mr. Mr. Basket? No, they flop. Like somebody barely touches them and they go, oh, and they fall down and they get, a, they get a whistle. I think so. Yeah, of course. But according to your standard of evidence, then that person was assaulted and pushed down. Well, we saw, we saw the... Again, you saw the thing on video. You are entirely too confident about what you know about other people. You're telling me the video was manipulated. No, I'm telling you that people fake things. I am telling you that people perceive things differently from their perspective. And you keep thinking you have the omniscience to understand other people's perspective. And that's very naive. Listen... If those, if those two cops who shoved that, that old white guy, if they, if they went like this to a 400 pound Japanese sumo wrestler and the guy fell down, hit his head, I would say that's probably faked. Okay. But not some old white guy. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't know what to tell you. I mean, I don't, I don't know the cops who were pushing them, that maybe the cop was an old white guy. I don't know. Uh, I, it doesn't matter what color they were. Okay. As far as I know, I'm just pointing I, I, out the fact to you that you're saying that this guy was clearly feeble. I don't know how feeble the officer was. I just don't know these things. And you're, you're just making these conclusions. Well, why, 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 excuse me, you're a cop, so you should know this better than I do. Why would a feeble cop be in riot gear? That doesn't the make vast majority sense. of cops are feeble. Were you feeble? No. But, but, but most people around you were feeble? Yeah, most cops are going to be much more happy. You're going to be much happier with the way most other so, cops would have behaved. So, 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 did you feel safe when you're going into a situation where 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 your life was being endangered and you were around a bunch of feeble uh, uh, cops that supposedly had your back? No, I, I've talked about this. I, I've talked about this numerous times, um, and I, I've pointed out tons of examples all over, and we can get into that. But I mean, totally not. I, I was I was very fearful of their ineptitude. I felt I was I was much more likely to be shot by another cop than somebody on the street. Mm. Okay. Well, listen. This is this has really been a good conversation, man. <laughs> and I really, really appreciate all your objectivity, whether I agree with it or not. Uh, some things I do agree with, others I don't. But but I do appreciate you know you're sharing your insights and uh, and your wisdom and um, and and your experiences, you know, which um, most people, myself included. Uh, don't have out there on the street, but I also have experiences, you know, that you don't experience. And these are, you know, these are things, you know, that need to be talked about in order for uh, police and community relations to, uh, to improve my, you know, your opinions of my experiences and, and my, my opinions of your experiences, you know, this is what needs to be on the table and be discussed 
so we can come to some kind of understanding of how each person thinks, how each person behaves, how each person perceives the other person. And that, you know, that is the first stepping stone towards, uh, toward, towards improving community police relations. You know, I, I've always said a missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution. So, you know, I sincerely appreciate uh, everything, you know, that you've shared, and I'm sure our listeners will, uh, will have their opinions. Uh, some may agree with you, some may agree with me, some may not agree with either one of us, you know, who knows? Uh, because everybody has, has an opinion. But uh, as, um, as the late Senator Patrick Moynihan said, uh, everybody is entitled to their own opinions, but nobody's entitled to their own facts. And, um, you know, very good saying. So let's definitely uh, continue the conversation sometime. Let's, you know, let's, let's revisit it and talk about some other things in, in the police department and talk about, you know, what you're doing in, in your consulting work and, uh, and how different, um, different areas can, can be improved, uh, not just Baltimore, but, uh, but nationwide and, and all that kind of thing. Because I think, you know, we all want things to be better between uh, the community and the police, especially the black community which seems to have the most, not, I won't say animosity, but most trouble with the, uh, with the police. So those are things, you know, that, uh, that need to be improved. We'll see what we can work out, you know, as we continue these, uh, these conversations going forward. So I want to wish you a very, you and your family, a very, very happy Thanksgiving. And yeah, I see and Christmas there behind you. And so, uh, you know, I, I get out that way. I get out your way every now and then. And next time I do, I'll give you a heads up. And we'll get together and go out and have lunch or something or dinner or something. And then we got to do this in person, too. Absolutely. No question about it. We will definitely do it in person. Anything anybody wants to say, I will literally drop at a moment, pretty much, to do these things. I'm very interested in the conversations, and I know they get heated, but I hope but that's that good, though. anybody can bring any question to this table, anybody in the audience. I mean, I will talk to them personally, myself, and discuss any of these issues. And I appreciate that very much. Okay, folks. I, you know, um, I'm very grateful to have for having Dr. Michael Wood join us here and give us his insights and observations on his career as a uh, as a police officer and a detective.